On this edition of the MBFC First in Gold podcast, I go behind the mic with the longtime voice of the Northern Iowa Panthers, Gary Rima. Gary, how are you today? I'm doing great, Kelly. Great to be on with you and uh, looking forward to this this time just to to talk with you and, and uh, just talk about everything that I've been involved with here at UNI. Yeah, me too. Well, uh, I would imagine you're a very happy man today because your Cubs... Uh, I've forced a game seven in the World Series. And, you know, I noticed on Twitter the other day that you actually went with your family to, to game five and uh, to Chicago and Wrigleyville. And so going back to that game five, which the Cubs won, you know, what was that experience like and how did you become a Cubs fan? Well, first of all, the, the way I became a Cubs fan is I grew up in a, in a huge sports family, Kelly, and, and my grandpa was a diehard Cubs fan. I can remember visiting him in Postville, Iowa, and he'd be sitting next to his little transistor radio, taking in, listening to Cubs baseball games. He, they owned a, a, a restaurant in Postville called Rima's Cafe, and I'd go down there. He'd have the game on the radio, and my, my dad, a huge Cubs fan, my brother's Cub fans, I just grew up with it. And and uh, lifelong diehard Cub fan. And then my kids, they, I took them to Wrigley Field on a regular basis when they were younger. Uh, and we, we still go in at times now, now that they're adults. So just it was kind of a family thing, family tradition to be a, a diehard Cubs fan. So when they finally made it to the World Series, um, it was actually my, my kids who said, Dad, come on, we're going to put this trip together. You're going. Even though we had a football game on Saturday night, that I had to broadcast, and uh, uh, my youngest son flew in from Florida oh, wow. to take in the football game to see uh, his nephew Jalen Rima play for the Panthers. We uh, we got to Dubuque Sunday morning and drove into to Wrigleyville and got in there about 11 a.m. Sunday morning and just spent the whole day and evening in Wrigleyville celebrating and watching the game. And it was just fun to, to do that with my kids. And then, first of all, to be in the World Series and then a World Series win for our favorite team is – it's a memory I'm, I'm never going to forget. So, yeah, pretty happy today. Be real, real happy on Thursday when I get up if we're celebrating a World Series championship. Yeah, well, speaking of that, I mean, how do you, how do you think you'll react if they win it tonight? Will you, I mean, will you cry? I, you know, it's been, it has been kind of emotional. It really has, just to think that, because you never knew if this was going to happen in your lifetime. And I think a lot about my grandpa, who has passed and he never got to, to see this, you know, a, a, a game seven World Series. And uh, I know how happy my dad is. He's in his mid 80s and, you know, he's just relishing this whole thing. So I, you know, I probably will get a little choked up. You know, I, I'm one of those that, you know, I watch the show Undercover Boss and, and I'll cry <laughs> when they're, hand, or I'll get teary eyed when they're handing out some of the, the, ten thousand dollars to their workers or whatever if i go to a, a movie i'm you know i, I you know, i'll kind of get choked up so yeah I, I may get a little choked up if they win at all that's great well you're in your 23rd year calling football and it'll be your 24th year calling basketball for northern iowa you know what kind of passion and drive does it take um, to be the voice of a school for this long um first of all Sports has always been a huge passion of mine. Uh, I wanted to be a pro baseball player. That was my dream growing up. I just thought, how great would it be to uh, to get paid to play the game of baseball? I mean, I just thinking it couldn't get any better than that. Well, then I got into radio, sports broadcasting, play by play, and that whole thought of doing something like this and get paid for it. I mean, it can't get any better than that. And then to finally get a Division One job. Um, I'm, I'm not a college graduate. I, I'm a self-taught play-by-play guy. Didn't go to college and, and get a degree. So to get a Division I play-by-play job doing UNI football, UNI basketball, there were some years in there I did UNI baseball, um, th- that passion and love of sports was always there. But then to do it at this level, Kelly, at the Division I level, I, it's just it's so fun. It never feels like work. And I try and I get a chance at times to talk to high schools or college classes. And I, I think that's one thing I try and stress to them is find out that thing that when you get up in the morning, you would love to go do that. You'd love to go do it every day and it would never feel like work. And if you can turn that passion into your profession, it'll feel like you never did work a day in your life. And I'm, and that's what I feel like I have here as the voice of the UNI Panthers. I, uh, I have friends and family and even my wife says, you know, you're so lucky you get up every day and you just love what you do. You can't wait to go 
get to broadcast a game or do your sports talk show or do the coaches call in shows. Um, and, and I do love it. I just, uh, you know, I've, I, I've been doing it a long time. Um, but I, and I, I can't even think of the day that I don't get to do this anymore because it is so fun. And, um, and, and I, we've had some great times. I think that's the other thing is you and I football and basketball have been so good. And I've been part of some of their biggest sports accomplishments from a 2005 appearance in the football national championship game to the the sweet 16 in basketball a win over kansas just to be part of some of those things and we've, we've had some down times too we've had some basketball seasons that weren't so good and we've had some football teams that had a losing record a, a, a lot less of those than the good years but so it's it's just been fun to be to be part of it and and the exciting run that they've had it's uh, it, it's just really a, it's been a, a pleasure in a small way to be part of it. Gary, how did you initially get the job? Um, the way I got the UNI job is I was the sports director at a radio station in Owine, K-O-E-L, A-M and F-M. I was, I was broadcasting about somewhere between 100 and 120 high school events a year from high school football, basketball. I covered wrestling. I was covering track and field meets and and then did a lot of baseball and softball and uh, when you and I made it to the NCAA tournament in 1990 the next year they decided to they had three different radio stations covering their games and the university decided that they just were going to have a flagship station and then distribute it out to affiliates and uh, the radio station I was working at KOEL had a, a hundred thousand watt FM station and we sat about 40 miles away from Waterloo Cedar Falls, and that station was trying to get in to the Waterloo Cedar Falls market. Um, and they thought, wow, if we could get the bid to be the exclusive station carrying you and I football and men's basketball, that would really help build our following in that area. So they bid on it and ended up getting the rights uh, to you and I Panther football and men's basketball. Claire Rampton, uh, who had been doing the you and I football and basketball for about 20 two or 23 years was the guy that got hired to do the games. But the general manager said, Hey, Rima, hang in there because you're the heir apparent to do this. And I'm like, really? I mean, is that, uh, he goes, no, I'm serious. You're, you're going to get your chance. Um, and then Claire retired three years later and the GM called me and said, Hey, it's, it's your time. You're going to take over and do you and I football and men's basketball. And it just, it just took off. But it really, uh, Kelly, it was a lot of kind of being in the right place at the right time. Um, I, I, I think they appreciated the effort I put in and all the high school stuff I covered. And uh, boy, w once the opportunity came, I jumped at it. And, and here we are 24 years later still doing it. That's awesome. You know, your grandson, Jalen Rima, is a talented freshman wide receiver this year on the football team. And so I wonder, you know, what, what that is like. How do you balance, you know, as the play-by-play -play voice with being his grandpa? Yeah, it, it, I tell you what, I had a little bit of practice on this because when I broadcast high school games, uh, when my three sons were going through high school sports, they all played football, two of them quarterback, uh, one of them was a wide receiver and a defensive back. So um, I, I, I just remember being so excited, but I knew I had to be careful that it wasn't, you know, the, the Todd Rhyme or the Scott Rhyme or the Travis Rhyme a show because I, I knew that wouldn't be fair to all the other teammates of his. But when you're quarterback, you call their name a lot. You talk about them a lot. So uh, I, I think I learned from that experience to be fair, get excited when they did something good, get excited when their teammates did something good and just kind of a, have a balance there. But I got to be honest, it's like at a whole nother level when your grandson is playing Division One football for the team that you get to broadcast for. Um, when he scored that first touchdown, of course, I was going to be excited, but I, I get pretty pumped up or pretty excited when anybody scores a touchdown for you and I. But that was special. And it, I, I think what's neat, too, is I think the fans understand. I, I've, I've been doing this for 23 years, and I think they know my passion for you and I and their student athletes and, and how much I enjoy getting excited when anybody does something really good. Um, uh, and it was kind of cool. We interviewed Eli Dunn. Uh, that night that you and I won and Jalen scored his first touchdown and our quarterback said, you know, I'm tri trotting off the sidelines after that touchdown throw to Jalen. And I'm thinking, I'm wondering what his grandpa's up there saying about that play. So I think they kind of get that there is a kind of a neat connection there or whatever, but uh, it's, it's special. It's, it's at a whole nother level to see him perform at, at 
you know, the highest level of college football division one, and then to do it for, uh, for you and I, his dad played baseball at you and I was a, a really good baseball player and actually was an assistant coach for you and I on the baseball team before he became a, a college head coach in Iowa. So, um, it's just, there's a whole neat you and I connection with this deal. I'm, and I think what I'm most happy about Kelly is that he chose you and I because he had a number of other teams that were trying to get him to come play football for them. One university wanted him to play football and baseball and uh, to, to be able to see him play every one of his college games is what I'm really appreciative of that you know otherwise I might see him play one or two college games a year um, and I get to see his his family and my other grandkids with that family a lot too as they travel to the game so the whole deal with having him be a UNI Panther is really just pretty special for me and and our entire family. Did you get in his ear at all during the recruiting process and and try and sway him towards Northern I I mean I know one of the I think one of the teams he was getting recruited by was North Dakota State. Yeah yeah I, I jokingly I, I I remember saying to my my son Todd I said Todd I know there's a lot of teams that want him but he can't go to North Dakota State. <laughs> I mean, I'd never hear the end of it around you and I. But I, I actually, I, I told, I talked to Jalen a few times, and I always told him, I said, Jay, do not come to you and I because of Grandpa. Just don't, because if if, if you felt like, well, I'm going to do it because I know Grandpa would love that and my dad would love that, and then it didn't work out, I, I would feel bad. I'd feel like you only came here because you thought that's what a lot of us in the family wanted. Go where you feel most comfortable, where, you're, where it's the best fit. And to be honest, there was a time when you and I was just kind of in the mix, but wasn't like his number one pick. He had Iowa State was on him really hard and and had him on a number of visits. And and uh, and then when Coach Rhodes was let go, I, I think some of that maybe changed a little bit. But uh, you and I ended up doing a fabulous job recruiting him. They, they really, he was really impressed with how Coach Barkham and Coach Ray at the time and, and head coach Mark Farley, how the, the recruiting process went for him trying to get him to come to you and I. Um, and he, he really made the decision all on his own. Um, it, it was neat, Kelly, how he finally, dis- finally said, I'm going to you and I. He was at one of our last home football games when we played Southern Illinois. And he, he was thinking a week or two before, I guess, that he, he wanted to make the commitment and, and tell Coach Farley he was coming to you and I, but he still wasn't 100% sure. And mm-hmm. his, his family said, now wait until you're, just, you're positive that that's where you want to go. And he was standing on the sidelines as the teams were warming up before we played Southern Illinois a year ago. And he looked at his dad and he said, Dad, I'm, I'm going to go tell Coach Farley right now I'm going to be a Panther. And he goes, oh, okay. And he started walking across the field uh, to go tell Coach as the teams were warming up that he was wanted to be a Panther, was going to commit. And Todd yelled over to his wife, Molly, who was a little ways away, said, hey, Molly, Jalen is going over right now to tell Coach Farley he's going to be a Panther. And she started running across the field to get up there with him and go with him. And he stopped. Jalen saw her and stopped and said, Mom, no, just – just I want to go do this all by myself. I just I want to go tell Coach I want to be a Panther. So I just thought that was kind of a cool deal on how it all worked out. He went over and told Coach Farley, says, Mark, I, I, I want to commit to be a Panther right now. And Coach, of course, shook his hand and said, you know, welcome aboard. It, just, it, just, it was just kind of neat how on his own he, it finally hit him that I, I, gotta, I want to commit and this is where I want to play my football. Good for him. You know, Oh Baby is uh, your your signature call. I'm, I'm probably obviously not doing it right, but... That was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> when and how did you come up with uh, that call? You know, it actually, the, the first time I ever... First of all, I got to say, growing up, you know, I listened to some great broadcasters and, you know, whether it was Jack Brickhouse doing Cubs game saying, hey, hey, or Harry Carey with his holy cow and... I followed Iowa sports a lot as a youngster, and there was a TV broadcaster, Bob Hogue, that always said, oh, my, when something good happened. Just, there's a lot of catchphrases out there. And uh, when I was broadcasting high school sports, um, I, I'm, all, I'm my worst critic. I'm my own, I still listen back to tapes of every game to try and do things better or whatever, make sure I'm not getting in a rut on how I broadcast stuff. But um, uh, about it was probably the, the early 90s, uh, I was doing one of my high school games and the next day I was re-listening to the tape and my son was the quarterback and he'd thrown a touchdown pass in the final seconds of a game to beat one of our arch rivals and I just it just kind of came out oh baby touchdown O-line 
Huskies win. And I was, I didn't even realize I said it. And I got listening back to the tape and I thought, hey, I, I kind of like that. That, that might be the, maybe that's what I'll use when something exciting happens. And it just, I just used it from then on when exciting plays happen on any of my broadcast, carried that into my you and I stuff as kind of the, the catchphrase I use. So, Old baby actually started way back in some of my early high school days, and it's just it's just stuck now. It's kind of crazy. I'll walk into a restaurant or something now, and people will see me, and they, they won't necessarily say, hey, Gary, or hey, Rhyme. They'll just go, oh, baby. So <laughs> I, I guess it's kind of caught on a little bit, Kelly. It's like your calling card, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that and kaboom, the basketball <laughs> oh, kaboom that's right. thing. That's another one that, yeah. You know, you also host a one-hour daily sports talk show. Um, It's called On Press Row. What do you particularly enjoy about that challenge? You know, what's really fun with that is we spend a lot of time talking you and I sports on that show, but it's I I dedicate the hour to pretty much talking Iowa sports, what's going on in the state of Iowa, because I think there's so many great things. We don't have Uh, any major league baseball teams or NFL teams or NBA teams, but our high school and college sports is really big in the state. So I spend a lot of time uh, talking about high school sports, our Iowa college sports, Iowans in the pros, David Johnson, you know, guys like that, that have former Iowans that are doing really well. But it's also fun to to open up the phone lines and just interact with the fans and um, talk about some of the hot topics or talk about what's going on with, with you and I or I or Iowa State. Getting great guests on. I love getting different people on across the state that are involved in in sports, whether it's coaches, athletes, broadcasters, sports writers. And I, I remember I started this show just over 10, I'm into my 11th year of doing this sports talk show. And I remember the very first year, the guy that was the program director at this radio station, um, about three weeks into it, he said, ah, Rima, you, you won't last more than a year. And he wasn't saying that, that the show wouldn't last more. He was saying that I would get tired of it, that after a year, you'll get tired of coming in every day and, and doing sports talk. And I, I, have, I've, I haven't, I've loved every day of it. There hasn't been one day that I'm like, oh, I, I don't want to go in and do this. I, I love doing it. It's so fun. So um, it's just, it's worked out so well. It, 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 it allows me to be a a full-time sports broadcaster year-round, doing all the UNI stuff, plus doing a daily sports talk show. It's just, it's been a great combination. So, but I love the interaction I can do with the fans, the callers, and uh, share some of my opinion on sports and how things are going in the sports world. And, and then interviewing a lot of really great guests uh, throughout this, the year. You know, you mentioned some of the the great moments in Northern Iowa sports. Um, And let's go back to last spring, the NCAA tournament, uh, Northern Iowa's, you know, and and Paul Jesperson's uh, last second half court shot against Texas uh, to Mm -hmm. advance from the first round. We're tied. You and I ball. Three seconds to play. Jesperson, a half court heave. You know, your call of that finish and his shot went viral pretty quick. Um, yeah. Were you surprised by that, first of all, that the call went viral? Um, and, and where does that game in particular rank among your your top Northern Iowa s- sports moments behind the mic? Well, it, it's one of the top, but I think part of it is because it's so fresh in your mind. It just happened. Yeah. But it, it definitely surprised that, that the call went viral. I just... You know, a lot of people say, did, you know, did, was that scripted? Did you have that written? I've said, you, do, you never plan for a half-court shot at the buzzer to win an NCAA game. And it's just, things just start coming out of your mouth with excitement and the reaction of the players and the fans. And, and uh, both Kevin Boyle and I are standing up and raising our arms. And it, it just, it was, it was so exciting because to, to have your team win a game like that, first of all, is just incredible. And then to know that, you're moving on in one of the greatest college basketball tournaments in, in the country. Just it, the thrill of that moment is just, it's it just over with. It's incredible. Um, it, it's definitely one of the top moments for me. I, I just, uh, I thought that was an amazing moment to be part of you and I broadcasting you and I basketball. 
the the NCAA tournament win over Kansas has to be number one. That that was just such a magical time, 2010. Nobody other than the UNI Panther coaches and players thought that they were going to win that game. I mean, it just you know we, we as broadcasters we hope that somehow we pulled off the miracle. I think as fans, you're you're just hoping is there any way possible? But the players and coaches really believed that they could do it. And then as that game went on. In 2010, the deeper you got into it, there were during commercial breaks, Kevin Boyle and I would look at each other and said, we might do this. We might pull this off. And then you got deeper into the second half, like, we're going to do this. We're going to beat <laughs> Kansas, the number one seed, overall number one. And, and then the, the, not the fallout, but the excitement after that win, the coverage that you and I got, I've never seen anything like it. I mean, from people that requested interviews with, with anybody from you and I, coaches, players, myself, um, the front cover of Sports Illustrated, and just everything that led up to that Sweet 16 game with Michigan State. It, that, that was just one of the greatest moments ever. Um, there's been so many of them, though, too. I mean, just the winning the Missouri Valley Conference postseason tournament last year with Wes Washburn banking in a uh, or putting in that three-point shot at the the buzzer to win that game and go to the the big just to get to the NCAA and you know football is another one that uh, when when we made it to the 2005 FCS national championship football game uh, in Chattanooga against Appy State beat Texas State in overtime to get there I mean though just just to have a small part of that uh, you and I history is just I, I'll never forget those moments ever. Yeah, it's, it's it's actually interesting. You you mentioned that MVC tournament win with with Wes because that that was actually my next question was to to ask you about that. Um, I can remember I was there and, and was shooting the game for the Missouri Valley, and I can remember afterwards talking to Ben um, and him, you know, talking about how proud he was of the team um, just because of you know how far they had come. I think at one point being two and six in in conference yeah. and just. To, to battle back like that and to to make it to the tournament and then obviously in, in dramatic fashion like that. With 16 seconds to play, tied at 54. Winner goes to the NCAA tournament. The loser checks into Heartbreak Hotel. Washburn way out front. He's got Ballantyne on him. Three to shoot it. West pulls up for two. It is gone. It is gone. He made the shot. sure that's a season that really stands out to you it is because th that that team was 10 and 11 at one time I mean didn't even have a winning record was kind of struggling and to see that group of guys with Wes Washman and Matt Bohannon and Paul Jesperson senior leadership and then Jeremy Morgan as the junior you know just those guys hanging in there and coming together Clint Carlson emerging as the player that he did um, to see that team run off all those wins against kind of improbable odds. You know, the team before them with Seth Tuttle and Deion Mitchell going to the NCAA tournament, Nate Buss, that group, um, going out to Seattle and, and uh, winning a game out there and, and then uh, losing to Louisville. And, and this team trying to get back to the NCAA and, and just get back to the Valley tournament and, and win that tournament. To see them rally and do that, it it. it it was it was unexpected. You just you, there was a point where you thought, well, we're probably not an NCAA tournament team this year. And then for those guys to get you there and then win like they did with the half court shot, it and you know the other thing, Kelly, that I would like to say, you know that that heartbreaking loss at Texas A and M that that really stung. You knew how much that hurt. You, you were seconds away from the Sweet Sixteen, but the way Coach Jacobson and those three seniors handled that, just with, with so much class, I. It's why I love you and I. I mean, that's the kind of people that I get to work with on a daily basis, the coaches, the student athletes. I mean, that they were crushed. I mean, and, and I, I travel with them all the time. I'm on the same plane or bus with them and the hotels with them. And you really get to know them like, like family and knowing how hurt they were that they didn't win that game. But then how they stepped to the microphone and talked about it and handled it. I mean, you just, you, you just have to be impressed with that, whether you're a UNI fan or not. And that's why I just, I, I just love what I get to do on a daily basis with, with these teams, these coaches, and these players. Yeah, that, they were uh, definitely one of those teams that even if you were an opposing fan, it, it's hard to root against them just because yeah. of what a classy group they are. 
My conversation with Gary continues shortly, but if you like what you're hearing so far on the MVFC First and Goal podcast, check out all the Lineup Media Group podcasts featuring all your favorite sports, including plenty of non-sports podcasts too. Now back to the show. Gary, you are the owner and GM of the the Cedar Valley Court Kings uh, basketball team. Um, and before that, I think uh, I had read you you spent five seasons as uh, the GM of the Waterloo Bucks baseball club. You know, how did that opportunity develop, um, you know, with the, the Court Kings to bring that to town? And, and how, how does that role challenge you? Well, first of all, when my kids were younger, I ran all kinds of sports teams. I, I ran a youth sports program in my city called the O-Wine Hustlers. We played uh, basketball in the wintertime and traveled with youth baseball in the summertime. Went to a number of AAU World Series or national championships. I just loved putting those teams together and yeah. coaching my kids. Well, then uh, I, I actually ran a semi-pro baseball team for about 13 summers that I was a, the player, coach, general manager of. My brothers all played on it. Really enjoyed putting that together. And then um, uh, in, uh, in 1999, an opportunity came along where I had a chance to become the general manager of this summer collegiate baseball team, the Waterloo Bucks, and I, and I jumped at it. I continued to do you and I broadcasting in the fall and winter, and I ran this summer collegiate baseball team in the summer. And another dream of mine was maybe to own my own minor league baseball team at one time when I was younger. Um, so this was cool to get this opportunity to GM a, a summer collegiate baseball team, especially in the Northwoods League, because we were playing 60 some games in about three months. I mean, it was like a, a short season minor league deal. We ran our home games just like minor league baseball does. So that was really fun. And then after five years, we led the nation in attendance for a couple of years, really built the team up as a really good business. And the owner who owned five hockey teams um, ended up selling the baseball team. And the new owners came in and, and uh, they said, you know, Ryma, you did a great job with this, but we, we can't afford to pay you what you were getting paid. We're going to bring in our own guy. So uh, I stepped away as the GM. But from that time on, Kelly, from 2004 on, after I was no longer involved with that that team, I thought, if the right opportunity comes up to to take on my own team, whether it's baseball, whether it's semi-pro football, basketball, I'm 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 going to look at them. So for the longest time, I kind of looked for an opportunity to do something like that. And then last November, I was actually just on the internet looking around at some different sports opportunities with teams, and I saw a new minor league basketball team was starting up in the Midwest. Got a hold of the league owner. And he said, I'm looking for one more team in our West Division, which includes Minnesota, Iowa, Wisconsin, Illinois. And he goes, I don't have any Iowa teams. And I talked to my wife, and she's like, let's go for it. Let's, let's do it. And that's all I need. I just needed her support. Yeah. She's a high school cheerleading coach. She goes, I'll start up a, a cheer dance team. And so I, I bought in and, and uh, start, started this minor league basketball team. And, and it works out great with my UNI broadcasting. It's a it's an April, May, June, July type season. And just with all the basketball people I've met in my 24 years of doing UNI basketball, I thought I, we probably can put together a, a decent team and have some good support. The community's really supported us with sponsorship and season tickets, but it, it was fun to put it together, to own it. And I, I'm really looking forward to year two. We're already in the process of of getting some things rolling for year two, signing players, finding players, finding sponsors. And uh, we won the league championship in year one. We won the Midwest Basketball League championship. A couple of former UNI players, Marvin Singleton and Anthony James, were a big part of that. Uh, we, we had a Division three player from University of Dubuque that played for us, and he got signed to go play in Spain at the end of our mm -hmm. season, which is really exciting. That's part of the goal is to get guys to go overseas. Yeah. Marvin Singleton, who wants to play at a higher level of pro basketball in the worst way, we got him uh, sent off to the NBL Canada Pro League. He's going to play for the London Lightning. So that's one of our goals is to help the, these young players continue on with their their pro basketball career and it's fun to get some former U and I guys involved and and hopefully as this grows we get more players maybe from the Missouri Valley Conference that want to take a shot with our team the Cedar Valley Court Kings but it's it, it's really been fun putting it together and looking forward to doing it for a number of years 
before I decide, okay, it's time to just retire and, <laughs> and go to Florida and spend some time with the grandkids. Yeah. You know, in just your family alone, you've been part of uh, some special sports moments. I mean, you just you just mentioned about the winning the league, the Midwest Professional Basketball League champions in the first year. Um, you know, I know you had sent me pictures of, of a state baseball title game. Um, you know, and so what moments stand out, you know, the most, you know, with your family? Oh, you know, wow. There's so many. It's like trying to tell you which one is my favorite child. <laughs> um, but th there are so many. I, you know, I, I, I think back to when my kids were younger and I was running a the the youth basketball program and we we had a 17 and under team and Rafe LaFriends was on my team a guy that made it to the NBA played for Canada uh, uh, Kansas um, my son Todd my oldest son Todd was on that team and we went to the we qualified out of a about an 80 team Iowa state tournament we qualified to go to the AAU National Championship tournament 17 and under in Winston Salem North Carolina that was just a, a unbelievable time. I mean, we were part of a, a great AAU national championship tournament in Winston-Salem, played at Wake Forest. Um, I, I think about that. I think about my daughter in, in 2009 when we won the NAFA uh, National American Fast Pitch Association 18 and under World Series softball title. That was just, that was awesome. All three of my sons played in, in the Iowa high school state baseball tournaments great times. But this past summer, uh, my oldest son, Todd, who not only coaches Kirkwood Community College's uh, baseball team, in the summer he coaches the Cedar Rapids Prairie High School baseball team. And his son, Jalen, on that team, uh, they won the, the large school class state baseball championship, 4A state title. First time ever in that school history that they not only won a state tournament game, but won the state title. And so, I mean, that was, it's really been an unbelievable year for the Rima family when you, you think about it with, with Jalen deciding to be a UNI Panther and Todd's high school baseball team winning the, the state championship and my basketball team winning the, the first ever MBL title. And and our Cubs are in game seven of the world. I mean, I just, I kind of pinch myself. I, you know, are we dreaming or is this all real? But, you know, sports have been such a big part of my life. And, and I've just been part of a lot of really great things. I'm, I'm really blessed. I'm really lucky. And, you know, I, uh, I, I just, I, I look forward to this kind of stuff every day just to be around the competition and the sports and the excitement of it. And um, so there, there's been a lot of high moments, I can tell you that, really great stuff. Yeah, you might need to go buy a lottery ticket or something yeah. here this week. Yeah. You know, when I think of Northern Iowa athletics, I think of a lot of longtime coaches, you know, like Mark Farley, Ben Jacobson, um, volleyball's Bobby Peterson comes yeah. to mind. You know, what do you think it is about the culture there um, at Northern Iowa that entices these coaches to, to stay there long term? For, you know, it's a, it's a special place. You and I really is a, a, a special place in college athletics. I, I think one, one thing that I think I've noticed with these, with coaches, whether it's Coach Farley, Coach Jacobson, when Coach McDermott was here, I think they like the kind of student athletes that they get to recruit, the kind of players from around the Midwest that are, are quality student athletes. Um, they can bring those kind of kids in, they can develop them. And, and then they, they found out that they can have great success in, at the highest level of college athletics. I mean, look at what UNI basketball has done, uh, you know, in the 21st century with seven NCAA tournament appearances. And they played in 11 NCAA tournament games. I can remember back in my first years of broadcasting UNI basketball with Verge Erickson and Eldon Miller was the head coach. And Eldon, a great man. I loved how he treated his players, brought in quality guys. But we were kind of working our way up the the Division One basketball ladder. I remember we talked about after some tough losses how cool it would be if we could just get to the NIT. Could we just could we just taste postseason tournament basketball like the NIT? And here now, you know, a number of years later, it's it's NCAA tournament appearances. So I I, I think the coaches have built something here. They see how special the place is. They have great facilities. Um, you don't. Uh, there's some pressure to win, but it's not like the, the pressure cooker of some of the power five 
leagues that are out there that, man, you, you, you know, you see what happens to some really quality coaches, whether it was Coach Licklider at Butler, National Coach of the Year, goes to Iowa. Three years later, he, he's out of a job. Or, you know, Greg McDermott, great success here. He goes to Iowa State. You struggle. All of a sudden, the media and the pressure, and, you know, he's really landed back on his feet and doing great at Creighton. But I think coaches see that, that, that to be at UNI, you have a chance to win every year. You have a chance to go to the FCS football playoffs every year. You have a chance to go to the NCAA in basketball and, and volleyball. And Ryan Jacobs is getting it done in softball. And Doug Schwab's doing it in wrestling. Um, I, I think, I think they, they realize how, how good it is. And, and I think financially, our athletic department's made it better and better for those guys to want to stay. And, uh, and again, it's just... It, it, the opportunity to succeed is here. You can you can work with great student athletes, and then that I think a lot of the pressure that the coaches feel is just it's self inflicted because the media treats them great here. Yeah, we all want to win. We want you know we we're down when we lose, but there isn't that hey get rid of this guy, get rid of that guy if things aren't going good. And I think there's something to be said for that, Kelly. Yeah, you know you know speaking of special athletes, uh, you had a chance to call a year of, of Kurt Warner's games. Um, you mentioned David Johnson, too. I mean, did you ever expect those two guys in particular to have the success? You know, obviously Kurt's uh, retired now out of, out of the NFL, and, and David's still playing and having a lot of success. Did you ever expect them to have the success they have had in the league? Well, a actually, I, I didn't get a chance to call Kurt Warner's one and only season. Oh, you uh, that's didn't? A, that's okay. a good uh, – I got to share that story with you, though. That's why I've done you and I football for 23 years, okay. and I've done basketball for 24, one more year. Because uh, when Cla I remember I told you Claire Rampton retired, and they hired me as you know to take over his spot. Yeah. Um, and that would have been 1993, Kurt Warner's first year, or his only year of being the quarterback. Well, that summer, Claire Rampton came back to the radio station and asked if he could do one more year of you and I football and men's basketball. And I saw him come into the radio station that day and I had a good relationship with him. Um, and he was, I think, 64, 65 years old at the time. And, and um, I saw him come in and leave. And when he left, he didn't look real happy. And usually he'd come and talk to me and he didn't. So I went to the GM's office and Tom Parsley was our GM, great guy, great radio guy. And I said, Tom, what, I just saw Claire come in, what, what's up? And he goes, well, Gary, he, he wants to do you and I football and basketball for one more year. And I said, well, what did you tell him? He said, I told him no. I said, we already told Ryan it's his job and Gary's going to start doing the games this year. And I said, I said, well, Tom, to be honest with you, if, if he wants to do it for one more year, I, 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 I want to do it in the worst way, but I would be okay with that. I mean, he's been doing it for 24 seasons. If he wants one more year, my oldest son, Todd, is a senior in high school. Their football team's going to be really good. Their basketball team's going to be really good. I coached all those kids when they were younger, and I, I, I would be okay to, to sit for one year and just continue to do what I'm doing. And he goes, well... I tell you what, I'm going to let him do football then, but he's not doing basketball. You're going to do basketball. <laughs> and I'm like, I, I'm okay with that. I, I, I would be fine with that. So he called Claire back and he said, Claire, if you want to do football one more season, you, Rima says, you do football, but I want Gary to do the basketball season. Um, and you'll be done at the end of this foot. And Claire says, I'll take that. So, and that was the year that Kurt Warner quarterbacked his <laughs> one and only season. But one fun thing, one fu good thing about that, Kelly, is they had me actually travel mm -hmm. with the team. I was at all the home games. I was kind of like the on-site producer. Um, I traveled to all the road games. I was out in Boston University when we lost that playoff game. Um, I was just in the booth, just kind of helping out, learning the, the, the ropes a little bit, if you will. Um, and so uh, even though I didn't actually call his games, I did see all of his games that year. And, and I, no way, no way thought that he would be the quarterback that he turned out to be. What, that, that's just one of the great, not only you and I sports stories of our time, but I think of, of NFL history. I'm a guy that, you know, was stocking shelves at Hy-Vee and then went to the Arena League and just his route. It's, it's really an amazing story. Kurt's an amazing guy, by the way. And then David Johnson. I, I think we all thought David Johnson was going to make the roster, that he was going to make an NFL team. He, we, we, we could see that in him, that the, he's really talented. Somebody's going to like him, but he's, you know, he might be the backup. You know, he might be the number three running back. 
to see him have the success he's having in his first two seasons. I, if somebody said, oh, I, I knew this was going to happen. I saw this. I, I, I would say, I, I don't believe you. <laughs> Even as good as we saw him on a regular basis, for him to go into the National Football League and do exactly to NFL teams what we saw him do to the likes of Iowa State or you know whether it was North Dakota State or University of Iowa, um, I, I just don't know if we really – saw that coming to be honest but man he he's a heck of a talent so fun so awesome for our university to have players that go do that at that level and i think for our league for our conference i mean it's 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 really special yeah you know gary you have your hands in so many things uh sports wise though what have you what have you not done that you would still like to do if i the only regret that i that i would say i have at, at this age where um, you know, there's not a whole lot of things aren't probably going to change is I, I probably regret I didn't do more baseball. I, I love baseball. I, I, I would probably wish I would have somehow, some way did a little bit more play by play of baseball, whether it was for a, a college somewhere or minor league baseball in the summertime. Um, I, I really loved running the Waterloo Bucks, but I couldn't also broadcast their games because I was too busy with the GM stuff. I actually called a few games to fill in, but um, that, really, that's the only thing. I, I, I've been so lucky. I, there have been a few other job opportunities or phone calls that came. And people wondered if I'd take a look at a job they had opened up. But I, I you know, I, I love it at you and I. Um, I'm not looking to go anywhere else. So, you know, some people might say, well, you know, do you wish that maybe you went to do some TV stuff or you went to another university? Not, not really. I, I, I found a great spot here. Um, I, I love the coaches and the athletic directors and the media relations people I get to work with on a daily basis. So not not looking to to move or regret that I didn't make a move. But the only thing that I wish probably I maybe would have done. I, I love baseball's always been my first love, um, but to do a little more play by play of baseball somewhere down the line would have been fun. But uh, it, it's been such a great ride, Kelly. I I, I have no regrets, no complaints at all. That's awesome. Well, Gary, this has been fun. Uh, I'm, I'm rooting that you uh, get your long-awaited Cubs win in World Series here tonight. You just want to see me cry. You just <laughs> want to hear that Rima shed tears and, and cry. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, let me just quick tell you, we were sure. in Wrigleyville on Sunday, yeah. and we found a great place to watch the game with a bunch. We couldn't afford tickets. I mean, they were, oh, they were like, a thousand. I think- Three thousand yeah. dollars, I think, is the minimum I saw. Yeah, a thousand to three thousand dollars. So we found a great place, one block off Wrigley on Clark. I mean, the lights of Wrigley were within sight. You know, if we stepped outside, we could hear the roar of the crowd. Yeah. And we, there was a guy there all by himself, probably mid thirties, all in Cubs gear, Cub hat. He had his W towel. He had his jersey on, just you know, all by himself. So I'm there with my four kids and a couple of other friends that came. We had a group of eight. And I just got talking to the guy, and he, uh, he, he said, hey, mate, I'm just here enjoying the game. And I said, where are you from? <laughs> he goes, I flew in Thursday from Sydney, Australia, wow. just to be here, to be in Wrigley. He goes, I don't have tickets. I spent $2,200 for a plane ticket, but I'm a diehard Cub fan. I just wanted to be here and just take it in. This, uh, and uh, so we, we just basically adopted him. He partied with us all night. <laughs> and after the Cubs won... He uh, he was just sobbing, just crying, tears, and he was so overjo- overwhelmed with emotion. And I thought, you know, that's if people that don't totally get this, that really did it for me to understand how much us Cub fans have invested in following our team forever. And here's a guy who comes all the way from Sydney, Australia, just to be in Wrigleyville with diehard Cub fans. And when we won Sunday, he was just overtaken with emotion. I, I don't know. That could be me tonight if they pulled it. My wife, you know, she may think I'm crazy or something <laughs> for being all emotional, but it's it's been really fun this year. And I, I've just had so many great times going into Wrigley Field with my family that uh, to see him get to this point. There were there was a time, Kelly, where I kind of thought, should I wonder if I should have encouraged my kids to be Cub fans. And now it's all been worth it to, to see what's going on right now. Yeah, that, that's dedication. Uh, somebody coming all the way from Australia. That's unbelievable. Unreal. Unreal. What a cool guy. Yeah, it was really neat. Well, Gary, thank you for taking the time to join me. Is there anything else you'd like to share? No, I just, you know, I, I, I do want to say that I love 
uh, being part of UNI Athletics and the Missouri Valley Football Conference, the MVC. Our, our league is so good, Kelly, and you see it. You, you see it now on a regular basis. But, our, the, you know, from, from Doug Elgin right on down to Jack Watkins and Mike Kern and Patty Viverito, it's first class. I mean, we go to the Missouri Valley Conference basketball tournament, and you feel like you're at an NCAA first, second round tournament. They treat you so professional. It's, it's run so well. It, it's really big time Division I college athletics. And it's one reason I love to be where I'm at. It's one reason I've never really reached out and tried to go different places because we have something special right here too for us broadcasters. And I've made so many great friends in, in the Missouri Valley Conference from Dave Snell at Bradley and Mike Reese and at Southern Illinois and Mike Kennedy at Wichita and, and, and all the guys. I mean, I, I should mention them all because you, you make so many great friends in this business. It's why it's fun. It's why we love what we do. It's why we travel and get home at two in the morning and get up the next day and get right back at it. But uh, um, uh, uh, you and I is a really special place, and, and I'm, I'm just so thankful. Whether you know, Whenever this l- great ride comes to an end, um, I'll have no regrets, and I, I, I love how, how well I've been treated and how everybody's been so great to work with. Well said. You know, like what you heard from Gary Rima in our MVFC First and Gold podcast, check out the many other podcast offerings from Lineup Media Group as we transition out of baseball season here in a couple of days to hockey. Jason Pucks with Panger may be the show for you. Head to lineupmedia.fm for more info or to subscribe. Thanks again, Gary. This was a, a lot of fun. Thanks. It was great being on with you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'll see you, I'll see you around the trail, I'm sure. You definitely will.